In this video, I'm going to talk about the rare gamba catchment area. And to begin with, I want to make sure we go over that word catchment area, or those two words, catchment area, to make sure we know what that actually means. So we have this river that goes through the whole catchment area, the Wara Gamba catchment area. And in this case, basically the, the catchment area is just all of the houses or places that are supplied by this river. That's the, there would be um, obviously water supply areas that would, that would send pipes to all these different places. So the, all of the areas that are supplied by this Waragamba River is called the Waragamba Catchment. In this case, the Waragamba Catchment is quite big, about 9,000 square kilometers. And it goes from Goburn, so this is Goburn here, to Lithgow, and then on, to the east areas of Rumba, right? So uh, Goburn, Lithgow, Rumba, and everything kind of in that area. The whole square kilometers, the square part, about 9,000 kilometers. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video. And there's quite a bit we have to talk about because Doppelin says gather, process, and present information on the features of the local town water supply in terms of the catchment area, possible sources of contamination, chemical tests available to determine levels and types of contaminants, physical and chemical processes used to purify water and chemical additives in water and reasons for their presence of these additives. So quite a few things. The first thing we've already talked about, which is to give a to talk about the catchment area itself, to give features of the catchment area. So that's what I just mentioned. It's nine thousand square kilometers. It has the river which goes through uh, connects Goburn, Lithgow and Marimba. So all of these bigger parts are part of this is by the way the Sydney's right here. Sydney's right there so it's quite close to Sydney as well. Um, so that would be a description or features of the actual catchment area. We've got this Warra Gamba River, and we have the catchment area being 9,000 square kilometers, and it goes from Coburn all the way to Rumbai and Lifco to the north. All right, so the next part is we need to talk about, so B, this was A, right, the catchment area. B is we need to talk about possible sources of contamination in this catchment area, so possible sources where we can cause pollution or where pollution might come from. And there are a few mines in the area. These mines can either have runoff, which means there could be some rain that goes and covers this mine, and then some of that rainwater might end up in the river. Right? So this is where we can have some pollution. And remember, that's where some of the actual heavy metals can come from. So there might be some runoff from the mines, abandoned mines, old mines, and there could be a pollution, a source of heavy metal pollution that comes from those mines. We can also have we also have quite a bit of land clearing in that area to make room for new farms and, and new agriculture areas. And that land clearing remember causes erosion or it leads to more erosion. And erosion can mean that there would be, for example, some of the minerals that would be in that soil could then end up in the river. Because erosion means just movement of soil, and that movement of soil can end up in the water. And that, for example, could mean that we have iron, um, so Fe being iron, iron pollution, because there'd be quite a bit of iron in that soil. Right? So iron can end up, too much iron can end up in our rivers, and that can cause pollution. Agriculture is a big one. There's quite a bit of agriculture in the area, and agriculture refers to, for example, um, problems with it can refer to the use of pesticides and herbicides. Now, they by themselves aren't a problem, but I'm talking about pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizers, the runoff of those, which means the runoff of those into um, the actual river. Right? So we can have pesticides, fertilizers, herbicides run off, which means they end up in the river, and that can cause, obviously, for example, phosphorus, Cause phosphorus or nitrate ions, phosphorus ion, nitrate and ammonia ions. These ions which cause the algae bloom, they can end up in the actual river, which means there could be an algae bloom in the river. There's also, there could be sewage problems. Obviously, this is not a picture of anywhere in that area. It's not that bad, but there are sewage plants in the area and they could be flooded, right? So if that sewage ends up flooding the actual river, that means there could be more bacterial growth because there will be bacteria in that sewage and that can cause problems with dissolved oxygen. And then it could also mean that it would add more of those phosphorus, nitrates, ammonia that could be an algae bloom as well. 
So even though usually sewage isn't a problem, there are sewage plants which can be flooded. And if they are flooded, then that could mean that we have problems. And garbage as well. So again, this is not a picture from anywhere close by. This is just a random picture of garbage. It doesn't look that bad. But the garbage does end up in the rivers. And if it does, that means we can have garbage obviously just generally polluting the area. Right? So garbage would be obvious pollution. So these are some of the sources of pollution. Land clearing, which causes erosion. Agriculture, which causes um, pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizer runoff into your rivers. Mines, which can also run off some of the uh, products of mines. That means there might be heavy metals, which end up in mine, uh, in rivers. Garbage, obviously, could end up in rivers. And sewage, if, if the sewage plants get flooded, can also end up in rivers. These will all be possible sources of contamination. Next, the next two are, even though they require a bit of detail, we've covered them in the past, so I'll just quickly cover them again. Um, C, chemical tests available to determine levels and types of contamination. So this, these are the ones we've covered in the first video, so CM5.1. And this was just talking about the different types of ions, different types of pollutions, and what we can use to measure them. So for example, total dissolved solids or particles. Remember, those were generally ions, so because ions are positively and negatively charged, they can conduct sort of electricity, which means we can use a conductivity probe. So the more conductive an actual sample is, the more dissolved particles would be in that actual sample. So we can use, we can test dissolved particles. We don't want to have, want to have too many of those inside of water. We can test it using a conductivity probe. We also want to make sure we test dissolved oxygen and BOD by chemical oxygen demand. The reason why we want to test dissolved oxygen is because if the Dissolved oxygen is low. That means that the actual bacteria, or the actual organisms, the, the aquatic marine life, won't have enough oxygen and they might die. And we can test that using paleographic oxygen probe, which I mentioned in that video as well. Now, in terms of the biochemical oxygen demand, that was just the idea of if you have so the dissolved oxygen after initial, and you minus that after the five day, you will get the actual BOD. Right? So um, that means we can find out how much dissolved oxygen is taken out of the river after five days. And the higher the biochemical oxygen demand, so the higher this, the more pollution there would be in terms of feces or bacteria or sewage. Right? So BOD is a good sign of um, bacterial pollution. We said also that, for example, to test heavy metals, we often use the atomic absorption spectroscopy. So they might do chemical tests to test for heavy metals, and they will use AAS. Uh, to test nitrates, again, nitrates, that was very problematic for algae bloom. That's these called algae bloom. And they can do the brown ring test to test for nitrates. So again, there's more. And I think when it comes to this actual C, so C part, the C part C here, this is just a summary of all the, the other dot points. So, um, and the same thing with the next one, D. It's also a summary of the actual water treatment dot point. So it says we could how, what kind of physical and chemical processes are used to purify water. And that was the water treatment plants. Remember, there are these different stages. For example, screening, coagulation, flocculation. Screening was when we removed the bigger parts, such as garbage bottles and all that kind of stuff. Coagulation, flo flocculation is when we start to make it into a big ball of sediment right, to make sure all of the particles, the suspended particles, dissolved particles, start going away from the water. Sedimentation was when you remove those actual bigger particles that have come at that stage beforehand. Filtration is when anything that's still small enough will get filtered out. Chlorination is when we put in chlorine to actually kill off the pathogens. And a pH adjustment just to make sure we have nice pH at the end. Uh, in terms of, so it says physical and chemical, um, screening would obviously be a physical process. We have a, a net, which is physical. Sedimentation, again, we remove sediment. That's a physical process. Filtration, we have like small little filters, which is physical. Chlorination, we, chlorine is a chemical, so it would be a chemical process. Coagulation is when we add a chemical to make it coagulate. That's a chemical process. pH adjustment is where we add some pH, and that's a chemical process. Uh, not we really add some pH, but we change the pH, and it's also a chemical process. So these are examples of some of the chemical and physical processes that we, have to, we can do. So if you know how to do the whole water treatment plant, you will know how to answer number D. And the last one was also what we've already covered, which was what kind of chemical additives are added to water and the reasons for these added chemicals. Um, and the ones that are added are fluorine, 
and chlorine. So sodium fluoride, that's where we get our fluorine from, fluorine from, uh, fluorine from I meant. Um, so that's where we get our fluorine from. And this is to strengthen our teeth. And teeth, generally, so we have strong teeth, right? That's where fluorine is, comes into play. So we add that, so that's what it says, what kind of chemicals are added. Sodium fluoride, so that's because we want to have that fluorine in our water supply. And why do we add them? So just reasons why, to make our teeth nice and strong, or especially for younger children and babies. And then we also add hypochlorite ions. And this is actually a form of chlorine, because we also add chlorine. The reason why we add that chlorine is because chlorine kills pathogens, right? So basically, it's there to make sure that pathogens kept are, are killed over and over again. Uh, they might some might develop afterwards, but the, if there's a bit of chlorine in the water, they make sure that if some do reappear, the chlorine is still there and they can still kill them off again. So kill off pathogens. That's basically this dot point. Even though it looks like it's a massive dot point, it's more or less just a rehash of some stuff that we already covered in the past. Right, so I'll talk uh, cover it again. A was the catchment area. We I chose the Warumba. Uh, Waragamba catchment area, which is 9,000 square kilometers in size, goes from Goulburn to Bathurst and Lithgow, not sorry, not Bathurst, Lithgow and Roomba and covers everything sort of in between. That is a f A, that was A, the catchment area. B, possible source of contamination, land clearing, might add some iron in it. Agriculture could be having pesticide, herbicide, fertilizer runoff that causes algae bloom, sewage can cause, sewage plants being over flooded can cause bacterial and algae bloom um, growth. We've got garbage, obviously garbage that's garbage, that's problematic in general. And then we've got mines, they can have runoff in terms of heavy metals and that can cause heavy, heavy metal pollution. So that was A and B. C was just the types of chemical tests, so for total dissolved particles we can use conductive probes, for dissolved oxygen we can use paleographic oxygen probe, and then we can figure out the BOOD, which is the biochemical oxygen demand. Heavy metals, we can use atomic absorption spectroscopy. For nitrates, we can use a brown ring test. That was C. D was just the different types of steps. So screening is physical, coagulation, flocculation is chemical, sedimentation is physical, filtration, physical, chlorination, chemical, and pH adjustment, chemical. The last one was talking about different types of additives, what we've added to it. Sodium fluoride, we added, that's our source of fluorine, and fluorine is good for our teeth, especially for young developing teeth, it's just the ones from babies. Hypochlorid ions, what we also add, because that's a source of chlorine, and that kills off pathogens, even long after we've removed it from that treatment plant. So that was that dot point, a big dot point, but hopefully just a rehash from some of the old stuff. I hope that was useful.